So the, the building is built, the, the tanks are in, the pipe work is in, everything's ready, there's a switch that says on. When I met Maurice Boerter in 2015, he told me he was starting a craft brewery. Little did he know that nearly eight years later, he would still be waiting for his final approval. My name is Holger Meyer and this is Beer World. Welcome to the show. And today our guest is Marius Boerter from Hazel Dean Brewing Company. Hi. Hi, Holger. How are you? All right. Before we started recording, I was, we were just chatting and trying to remember when we went on Dani's beer tour together, and it was in 2015. And, uh, yeah, Marius was kind enough to show me my beer book that he bought on that tour and uh, that was that was I had to sell all these beer books to to finance the tour for me <laughs> I remember uh, getting onto the bus and up here stood up and just announced that I was there selling books and I think that helped no for sure for sure I mean I have one yeah. <laughs> I bought one <laughs> yeah and your brewery wasn't open then when when did you open the brewery I think I think this tour was at the beginning of of 2015, March, April, thereabouts. And at that stage, that is exactly the time that we started realizing or thinking that we're going to open a brewery or I'm going to open this brewery. And that's actually why I went on the tour. Um, I mean, there's not a lot of you can't just today decide in two months I'm going to do one of these tours you know maybe in the states or Europe you can just jump on one of these tours but it's not very common in South Africa as such a tour so I thought it a great opportunity to to meet other like-minded people make some connections and learn some stuff yeah. <laughs> along the way and have a good time it seemed <laughs> yeah yeah we had a good time and that's really what what I think or what I'm trying to do is 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 just nurture the the beer community um and there's so many aspects to that i think there's a lot of people that focus on the brewing part i don't do that i focus on the people and the i guess the trade and the business side of of the beer industry yeah. and and of of course the tourism the traveling the visiting the breweries and exploring new beers Tell us a little bit about your background, Morris. You are in Pretoria now, but where did you grow up? So I grew up in Newcastle, in northern Natal. Oh, okay. Um, so thus I'll always support the Sharks. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get away from that. No, so we, I lived there until um, uh, my, basically my, my sister was out of the house. She had to go to university. Uh, my mother was studying uh, again, um, in later years doing uh, psychology. So we we decided to make the move to move to Pretoria. Everybody kind of, that was kind of the logical thing to do. So so my high school years I kind of spent in Pretoria. Uh, I went to Pretoria Boys High School. Mm -hmm. And after that, obviously, University of Pretoria, Takis, it was the closest university. And I studied engineering, mechanical engineering. So that's really my background. After that, um, um, I did an honors and a master's and then obviously started working. Um, and that was about, yeah, coming all the way back to what we were talking about 2015, when this, you know, thought process is starting, started to develop about starting a brewery. And yeah, it's now been sure, five, six, seven years, eight, almost eight years later. And, you know, people constantly ask me, but don't you miss engineering? Don't you miss engineering? And I can tell them, well, I certainly miss the money. <laughs> because <laughs> none of it is really in, in, in brewery. It re in, um, I, I won't say there's none of it, but uh, um, I think it's, a, if, if you, if you, it's, it's really a passion project. I don't think anybody should open a brewery who thinks this is, this is their big ticket to, to earning a lot of money. Mm. Um, it's, it's really, I think, a passion for it. Um, a passion for the people, uh, the product, what it does, bringing people together. Um, I mean, we're, we're going to an awesome festival in a week from now, the Clarence Beer Festival. And that's kind of since we started the brewery, that's I think any brewery would want to be at the Clarence Beer Festival. It is really um, well hosted. It's sort of the pinnacle, I would say, of I wouldn't say necessarily recognition, but it's kind of 
an amazing stage to showcase your brewery, your products, you as a person, because it is a festival that is very, um, the brewer has to be there. You have, you, you, you get a chance to really interact with the people. Um, so yeah, that's a short background on, mm. on, on, on me. Yeah. How long, how long have you tried to get into Clarence? Has it been a while or is it your first time? Oh, no, I mean, um, you'd be stupid not to ask, right? If yeah. you don't ask, <laughs> you never know. So um, at, at the same time, there's only so many spots. There's yeah. only spots, you know, 20, 25 max maybe breweries at such a festival. So you can understand that, you know, especially before COVID, um, maybe even a few years before COVID came, you know, South Africa's beer scene was was really booming alive. New small breweries were popping up all over the over the show. You know, and now, I mean, I don't know the exact stats, but I can only imagine that we've shrunk, just COVID might have shrunk 30% of that, that industry. Mm. Um, I mean, breweries that are not with us anymore. So, um, but yeah, coming back, obviously we, we try to get into the festival. Um, but I suppose after a while, you know, we tried once or twice, but, um eventually you know not going to the festival the festival doesn't mean you don't have good beer yeah or something like that yeah um uh, so one shouldn't take that no sorry there's not space as as a negative um i i think if it like in afrikaans it says be real dry you yeah. know eventually your turn will come yeah um and yeah, we're grateful for that this year and to to go along mm. Um, how did you get into the beer scene? So I think most most brewers get into the beer scene through uh, homebrew, brewing at home, um, fooling around. I, I suppose my background from mechanical engineering, tinkering with things that are boiling and pipes and cooling, and um, it, it kind of comes natural, um, mm. the cleanliness of things, the sterilization all those aspects um it's 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 quite an in, uh, industrial process on a very small scale yeah um so i suppose i started home brewing um with two of my friends um somebody asked me a while ago to give a brief just a few uh, one-liners I, I think it was lucy for for the um, magazine uh, just to say, how was your experience? How was what? How did your first brew go? <laughs> and I remembered that about my first brew, and it obviously it was a um, a kit brew, uh, um, with the syrup, the can of syrup, and you just chuck everything, boil it, um, and you know, the amount of we were just uh, flying by the seat of our pants, really, just like making up steps or steps were just totally missed or it was uh, it was a disaster. I can, <laughs> I can tell you that. It was a disaster. You know, the beer tasted awful. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I'd say the amount of fun we had that evening brewing that beer, even though it was a kit beer, you know, well, brings fond memories to me. So that's sort of, sort of how it started. And um, obviously... A lot of home brewers would like to take it to the next level, but uh, over the past few years, I've learned also a lot about business, not just mm. brewing, because yeah. there's also a business you have to run. And if you don't have an outlet to sell your beer, um, it's cool. You can brew the best beer in the world, just like agriculture. You can uh, grow the best tomatoes in the world, but if you can't sell it, you're not going to grow any more tomato. <laughs> So for us, we were fortunate in that uh, um, the Hazeldean Farm, where our brewery is situated, um, started uh, what's called the cowhouse market. And um, obviously, there was an opportunity immediately that arose for a craft brewery to be sort of a, an anchor tenant and um, a stall that can showcase their beer. So I remember still in those days, it was just after the, um, the tour, and I had met Rob Cast on the tour and I got his number and I phoned him up and I said, listen, I'm in serious trouble here. I need to come up with some really solid recipes really quickly. Um, so although he didn't explicitly help us with recipe development, he was extremely inspirational in pointing me in the right direction 
of how to go about this. Um, and I think that's again, like you said, you know, you guys, you focus not necessarily on the beer or the this or that, but really the community mm -hmm. around it. And I think that's that's something that I have never experienced really in in any other industry. Not that I've been involved in many industries, but uh, really the sense of community. I mean, the other day, for example, I I lent uh, or I gave a, a beer keg and dispensing equipment to a friend, they were heading off to Dolstrum to go play some golf and have a, a, a whole weekend of it. And when he get, got there, he phoned me and said, They're out of, there's no gas. And the gas must have opened in the car and leaked out. I mean, he's hundreds of k's away, 250 k's away. I'm not, I won't be able to get him gas. And I phoned um, the Anvil Ale House and I spoke to Chris, who I know well, and he was able to, to sort them out in no time. You know, and that's what I like about this. It's that sense of community. It's that willingness um, to help each other. Yeah. I mean, next up, festival together, and he needs gas from me or something, or cups, or I don't know, and we'll we'll be there to help him. Yeah. Um, at the end of. So yeah, that's that's really. Um, um, sorry, we're jumping all over the place a little bit, but uh, coming back to the car house, so it really gave us that opportunity to have a very steady outlet for our beer. Because again, you can brew, you know, we were contract brewing at that stage um, uh, with our beer at uh, Brew Hogs. And you know, the batch sizes, they're 3,000 liters, you know, so you've got to sell 3,000 liters. <laughs> That's a lot of beer if you just start out. Um, without the cowhouse, it would have been impossible. I mean, imagine how many restaurants you will have to have dispensing maybe one keg a week uh, to fill up that, those volumes, it will be near impossible. So, you know, that really was a blessing for us. And I suppose a, a kickstart for if, if, if I wasn't there to start off saying, hey, guys, I will supply, I'm going to make a lager and a Pilsner and a Milk Stout. Well, Milk Stout wasn't there at the time. Vice beer, we, we did those three. And a Vice beer, and I will supply the volumes, and I'm going to do it in three months' time. Um, you know, we had to really fast track this brewery idea. And I think sometimes that's what you need. You need, we need that spark under our asses to literally say, you have to do it now. And if you, if the opportunity comes, it's only yourself to blame if you didn't take it. Yeah. Um, I think South Africans in general are very risk averse people. We want to have that interview and the, have signed the offer of the new job before we give these people notice of this job, you know. We're like a, we're like a monkey that don't want to let go of, uh, of the next branch before we hold on to, on, on to the next. And uh, this, this business I've found is full of risk. And um, if you just actually, but, but at the same time, South Africans are extremely resourceful people. Yes. Um, if, if the need arises, you'll make a plan, a boot market plan, you know, you'll, you'll get the beer made, you'll get it sold, you'll, you know, so um, the car house is still going and uh, um, it obviously COVID wasn't kind to it um, with all the bans and so forth. Uh, not only the liquor bans, but that first one, which was nobody goes anywhere really, um, which was quite quite bad for the market, and we're definitely still recovering from that. So our sales isn't what it used to be, but luckily, you know, those volumes over time has been made up by distributing in the uh, in the restaurant sector, mm. um, also in uh, events, beer festivals. Um, I think it's a good thing that your your income streams are sort of diversified in various things and not just sitting in one pot because it's always you know, over the years, I always thought, what if a car house goes bust or under? It's like a huge percentage of our revenue that won't be there. And we've always tried to push other revenue streams um, and still are and will always do so in future. T tell me a little bit about the the whole situation there. You, um, Hazel Dean, Irene, the car house market, what's the setup there? So... Um, the cow house, um, so this is um, my wife's family that started the Hazeldean farm, I think it was almost 1942. Okay. Um, so they came, uh, the 
a previous generation. So that would have been my my uh, father-in-law's father. They were at the time um, farming in um, the Idas Valley, in Stellenbosch, actually. Okay. And they got about 15 cows on a train and moved up to Pretoria. That's the um, wrong way. And Everybody in, from Pretoria is supposed to move <laughs> to Stellenbosch. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I, I think it's a, it's a daring move. It all, always reminds me of those settlers in the Wild West time of America, you know, going out to, 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 to the West, you know, super dangerous, high risk, probably will get shot or some disease or killed by Indians or whatever's the case. But the reward, if you could stick it out, I think is massive. You know, that's why it worked, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so was that um, uh, was that the original Irene Dairy that um, everybody knows? No, no, the the Irene Dairy um, they're actually a different uh, um, a group of people. Okay. So they uh, they actually were farming in in Irene. So um, uh, so so that's the Van der Beel family. Okay. I believe so, um, and these ones are the Mallison family. So. Um, yeah, the Irene is 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 totally separate. Um, I think the, the 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 people knew each other. Um, my um, father-in-law's father and um, um, those guys over there. I suppose in a small community like that, uh, at the times you you would have known known the other dairy farmers yes. of the area. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, so it was a it was a dairy farm, um, Hazel Dean, and then over time, um, I suppose it was almost uh, 2010 thereabouts, 2009. It just got to a stage where it just uh, the farming setup just wasn't uh, feasible anymore. I mean, there's a reason why these dairy farms do really well in the Eastern Cape and in KZN is because of the rainfall, mm. and you can park. The, feed your cows almost the entire year round. Uh, whereas in Pretoria, you need to actually grow lucerne, make silage. And uh, so you need quite a massive sized farm, mm. work the farm, and then create your own feed for the cows. Otherwise, you've got to buy food in or feed in. And the operations, you know, the margins are quite tight on milk mm. um, already. So it just got to a point where it just wasn't really financially feasible. Also at that stage, you know, Pretoria at the moment is really growing out towards the east. And a lot of the farms started getting sold off to development um, at the time. So at that stage, kind of the, the calculations was made that it's actually more profitable to now actually sell the land than to continue the agriculture, um, which is quite a shame. But at the same time, um, from back then, it was sort of always the idea to keep out about 100 hectares for our mountain biking parks, picnic sites, chalets, the brewery, the cow house, really uh, almost like a destination like Babylon Sturen in the Cape, where it's sort of agriculture mixed with beer or wine, um, the whole uh, fork to table um, vibe and movement. Um, and that's something we'll definitely have at the brewery. Really, um, the Americans have coined a nice term for a brewery like that. They call it a farm brewery. Um, and I've never heard of any farm breweries in in um, South Africa. I suppose that there are a lot of breweries on a farm, but the, the term isn't really coined here or used mm. here. We're a farm brewery. And I really think we that's something we'd like to aspire to. Um, we're a farm brewery, and we'd really like to um, eventually get to the stage of growing some produce on the farm and on site that we can actually use in the beer as ingredients. Mm. Of course, we'll do that uh, with uh, tomatoes, microgreens and the likes for the taste room salad and so forth. But uh, uh, yeah, who knows? I mean, I'm uh, at later in the year in October, I'm going on that uh, beer fellowship uh, to the States uh, that uh, USADF uh, fellowship program and that's uh, um, basically two weeks of going around um, various parts of the states 
and also specifically meeting with the hop growers association and the malt producers and the malt growers associations um, the it, it's very much set up to impart knowledge not just about general brewing beer brewing techniques because of course they are at the forefront of of, of any new idea hop backs um, these kind of things, but uh, I think the other half of the program is to make connections and see, but how can we actually become a client of these guys in in a, in a bigger fashion, um, even to the extent potentially where you know that's what our, my dream certainly is to eventually have a a malt field, you know barley. There's a barley field there, and you can go walk through the barley, and there's a greenhouse over there, and there's hops growing in it. Not it'll never replace the, the masses of hops that you'll have to use use in a commercial sense but it's really just something that people can i, I think 80 percent of beer drinkers don't know what hops is actually mm. you know it's uh, they they've heard this word they might know it's a plant but they don't really they haven't held it in their hands open it up smell those the um, lupulin glands um so it's really yeah our hope that we will one day get there um, in a sense. Yeah, that's a wonderful concept, and uh, I'm sure you're in the right area for, to do that, something like that. Yeah, the, as I say, it's a, it's really a pity that the the brewery scene have shrank so much. You know, it's it's never true that more breweries is going to be more competition. It's just like having a street with five restaurant options yeah. rather than one. It will eventually pull more people to that street that will want to go maybe once a week to a different one mm. over the course of a month so um, uh, and not keep on going back. Yeah. So tell us about the beer or the craft beer scene in, in Pretoria. Yeah. So obviously I think from a drinking craft beer perspective, it's really now been pushed into most restaurants i'd say that uh, uh not most restaurants but you know definitely pioneered by people like devil's peak and darling and jack black um the bottle store trade is a difficult one for us um the stuff isn't always in a fridge mm. and especially because none of our beers are pasteurized you know the lager and the pilsner are well filtered so it's going to last quite long but but none of the other beers are filtered so, so having them at a bottle store, it's a difficult sell. You know, people do pick up a, a, a six pack of Devil's Peak before they, they pick up yours just because of the price point as well. But uh, so we don't focus on, on bottle stores so much. Are there any bottle stores that stock your beer? So in Pretoria, it's Grundloof, uh Liquor City. I mean, they have always supplied, uh, stocked a, a wide variety um, of beers. And besides the market, where's the best place to try your beers on tap? Capital Craft obviously is a massive outlet for us um, in Pretoria for, for having it on draft. And then, yeah, every now and again, they we do supply, supply them with a keg of some of the barrel aged stuff. Um, at the moment, I know they have the whiskey barrel aged uh, a sour mash milk stout. Um, on tap, on a nitro tap, which is which is very very nice. That sounds exciting. Um, it's sour. So, yeah, it's a sour beer, but it's not so sour that you go like, oh, you feel the sourness here, yeah. <laughs> which I know suddenly every everyone is feeling. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but is it not possible to get more draft outlets? So so you'll definitely get a tap, but obviously because you just can't get to the margins of the big guys, mm. um, and from a restaurant perspective. Um, it's very difficult to convince a guy, take me, and you'll, but you'll make less money, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> than, than, than a darling or a devil speak. And at the same time, by no means though, those beers are necessarily bad. Mm. You know, they uh, might not be brewed to be as flavorful or as many options available, but they're, I'd say they're amazing gateway beers if you want to start delving into more barrel-aged beers or sour beers or or more hectically brewed saisons or this or that or the other. So definitely the scene is is a lot more open from a consumer point of view. From a brewery point of view, you know, the first brewery in Pretoria was Draymond's mm. Brewery. And, you know, they might have 
even been operating when I moved to Pretoria yeah. in, in 95, you know. So they were going for a very long time uh, before that. Um, and they're still going. Mm. So, I mean, there's, there, there's Draymond's Brewery, there's Friars Habit Brewery that's still going. Um, uh, there was Tamela, which is kind of still going, I, I, I think. Um, I think, you know, COVID have caused all of us to almost lose touch with each other. Mm. You know, there was definitely a more sense of community going on before that. And now feels that, you know, a lot of people, uh, some guys uh, um, went overseas. Um, you know, Louis from Friars Habit, Jono from Leaky Tap, also Pretoria Brewery. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, life doesn't stop. People go on with and pursuing whatever opportunities uh, come around. So I think it's 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 very much like any industry. There's going to be ups and downs, but there's also going to be new breweries open. Um, I think it's hard for a new brewery to open these days. Um, it's 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 very capital intensive, um, and there's just uh, yeah, there's no getting around that. I suppose. Uh, your brewery as a destination now, is it only open on weekends or when the market is on? Yeah, so a little bit more detail about, about that. We, um, yo, Our journey there was quite long. Um, we had a location on the farm to do the brewery and we started commissioning the tanks. Uh, we, we decided to buy local, get them locally manufactured by uh, Metal Tank Industries. Uh, they're in Benoni. Mm. Uh, East Rand side and you know for for us from Pretoria East to drive the back roads there is really almost just half an hour and uh, kind of after sales support that they can deliver just being 30 minutes away and having most valves um, and piping and so forth just on site we we decided to to pay the bit extra but have that assurance of of after sales support um, so they manufactured the tanks and at that stage, um, all our zoning and everything wasn't sorted out yet. So we, um, we weren't sure where exactly the brewery was still going to be at that time. And, the uh, the, where it was going to be, it was going to be sort of at the, the, the old dairy factory because, you know, there was an area that was quite already with the right drainage and tiling and everything in place. Um, that has now subsequently become our barrel storage facility, which we can maybe talk about a mm. bit later. And then there was a very old building. You might see the building on our website, um, the old barn. And then you know, after long investigations, it was just deemed too expensive to retrofit that old building. You would have to have built a whole new building inside the old building, actually, to get it structurally stable. And then we had another... Um, venue which was the calf barn which is the barn that all the calves once they were born were housed in and cared for just the first few weeks of of their lives and after that we decided let's just build a new building from scratch <laughs> <laughs> so, so 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 everything like jumped around a bit but in but at the same time the tanks were finished man, manufacturing and we had these tanks but we had no place to put the tanks so um they were actually in storage at Metal Tank for over two years. What? While we waited for this building to be finished. Um, and the building was kind of... Uh, so so they started to install and then COVID came and, and everything had to get halted. So the actual install of the, of the equipment, the tanks and the pipe work took almost a year, I'd say. Uh, which should have taken maybe three months. Mm. So that whole process would, would dragged out really long. Um, so the, the building is built, the, the tanks are in, the pipework is in, everything's ready. There's a switch that says on, <laughs> I suppose, uh, in, in a matter of speaking. Um, and the last sort of uh, aspect for us there is the excise tax registration. So, I mean, everybody, somebody should write a book or a manual on how to get your licenses for this industry because every, it seems to me that every province is different, every town is different. Um, this guy waits a year for his micro manufacturing license where we got it in three months um, without a building 
uh, where everything was just kind of, you know, on, on plan. Um, so the last process for us is the excise tax. So we're, it took about four months just for them to process the excise tax application to the extent where they could give us a reference number. So we're waiting now for a representative to come and just sign off that, yes, there is a brewery here, there's tanks, everything looks sterile. Um, and oh, we've been waiting for that now already for a month. So I wouldn't be surprised if it took us another three months. So the SARS process is going to, at the end of the day, take longer than getting your micro manufacturing license, which is bizarre to me because here you are trying to create jobs and you're trying to give the country money in excise tax. Mm -hmm. And it just means they don't want your money, <laughs> which is just doesn't make any financial sense, but so be it. Um, but at the meantime, we're still contract brewing. Were you brewing? Uh, so we, we, we really were fortunate uh, to, to start brewing when our P-Way was still at Brewhog. So we, we, we brewed with Brewhogs now for almost seven years. And uh, the service level where we've been getting there has really been phenomenal. Um, the only uh, flip side is they are 3,000 liter batches. So mm. if you can't have 3,000 liters, you know, it's, 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 it's a problem. But um, yeah, we, we actually brew there. We brew at Draymond's and we now brew at OC Brewing that is also uh, putting out phenomenal product. Mm. So we, we're really happy with this. And I, I frankly, you know, at times I was so frustrated that we just can't get our brewery now. It's just, it seems that this is the next boulder is being rolled in front of us the whole time, the whole time. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, we didn't uh, sit on our hands. We, we continued to, uh, to build the brand, the brand name and the beers, and we started the barrel aging. So we didn't let that stop us. Um, you can really still get a long way, but still contract brew. Mm. Um, I feel, you know, a lot of people, either the brewer or the brewery owner is ashamed to tell people that they're contract brewing because it's almost like I'm not quite part of the club yet. I'm like there, but I'm not there. <laughs> and at the same time, you know, the um, I, th I think in a way, you know, that, yeah, it's sort of uh, – a hindering it a little bit, I'd say, that, that if you're contract brewer, you're not quite a brewer or considered a brewer. Um, but uh, we, I mean, you suck it up and you, you continue. The important thing is that you have a vision and that you're working towards that. And you should focus on that. I frankly don't see any other way to start a brewery other than contract brewing. Yeah. It uh, mitigates so many risks for you up front, not having that expense of, of, of buying the equipment brewing beer for six months or a year and thinking, well, this isn't really for me. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so we're currently still contract brewing. And, yeah, hopefully our excise tax gets sorted out and uh, we can uh, flip that switch. That, that is an amazing story, but it's it's taken a hell of a long time. But what what impresses me is that obviously you've got, a, you've got the market and you, you can – so you can, I mean, not everybody can flog 3,000 litre batches of beer. That, I mean, you, yeah. you, you deserve nod, naughty points for that. I mean, it, 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 I'd say a sense of inspiration and something, if I look back at, that was sort of a test case for that concept was Smack Republic. Mm. And about a year before... It was around about the same time, or maybe a bit earlier, a year earlier than, than the 2015 beer tour. Um, it was, uh, um, there was a, um, it was there at the airport, a conference facility at the airport was held. I can't remember now. It was a beer conference. Mm. Um, they haven't run it now for a few years or two years because of COVID. Um, but there was a beer conference that, I remember there was a Q&A session afterwards and uh, um, Smack was there on the stage and basically the audience could just ask questions. And, you know, one of the questions alluded to, but how did you start? And they also said that, you know, they were fortunate enough that where they were in Joburg, they could literally, when they opened their doors, there was a market there on mm. Saturdays. Um, and 
they said that was, I wouldn't say a saving grace, but that caused them to be successful, um, especially in those first few months and years, to have that big market, um, market and market yeah. <laughs> uh, available for them. Um, so, yeah, I suppose that's the only way, if you've got a big outlet like that, how you're going to flog the 3,000 liter batches. Mm. And it's nearly like those markets, we, we don't often realize that they are incubators. I mean, they, they make little businesses. And if, if you look at the, the biscuit mill in Cape Town, I think a lot of the, the early craft brewers were there, Darlings and uh, Camel Thorn was there. And, you know, there yeah. were a lot of people. And if you think about Durban or in, in Chungweni at the market, the stand evens are there. And yeah. I don't think the stand evens need to sell anywhere else. They're just happy to sell at their market. Um, knew the same and i mean i definitely went to visit smack at their market once or twice and it, it's a it's a wonderful thing to go to these markets and enjoy these these craft beers yeah i mean when we drew up our business case way back when i mean they say your business case is outdated when you've just finished writing a business mm. case <laughs> it's so i mean it's a very fluid industry and there's a lot of thumb sucking that has to happen you just don't have a crystal ball for the future. But um, to me, there's really only two real ways you're going to go about it. Either you're going to be really big and you're going to really take small margins, but you're, just, you're really pouring a lot of money and emphasis into your distribution network. And you distribute you know, nationally and you're in literally every bottle store, every tops. Um, and I think that's what... what, what uh, was so successful with Jack Black in that mm. they put craft beer literally to into the reach of people. Mm. Um, but, and they were contract brewing at that time as well. This was way before they had their own brewery. Um, and you either follow that business model or you follow the business model where you, you do the market, where you really almost have to create your brewery around a destination. And that's what makes it so difficult because if your brewery is in an industrial area, it's very difficult to make it a destination. Mm. Um, apart from the guy, you know, that that's in that area and it's Friday afternoon and they want to go to the brewery and have a few pints. And but those to be are, the, busy those are not the guys the you want. <laughs> <laughs> not seven days a week. <laughs> I don't think. Yeah. So, and I, and I think this is, uh, um, as times have gone on, people really like this, uh, um, like they always say, if you can cater and keep the women and children there, the guys will stay there. Mm -hmm. And they're going to drink a lot of beer and, and the whole family will have a good time. The kids will have a good time, the moms, the dads. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so, so for us, we're lucky that that is what we are busy growing on Hazeldean Farm. Um, it's actually, we've rebranded that area, the 100 hectares we're keeping out as Hazeldean Valley because it's uh, in the Pinoz River Valley um, here in Pretoria East. So, yeah, at Hazeldean Valley, we're lucky that we have the mountain bike tracks there with 60 kilometers of single track. There's dedicated trail running. There's horse riding. We've started an indigenous tree nursery with over 40,000 trees on stock at the moment. Um, the brewery will soon open. The cow house is there. So... There's, it's it's really exciting times actually. I mean, I think ten years from now we'll back we'll look back and say, wow, we created something here. Mm. Um, and I think that plays into that what what people here living in Pretoria East, you know. So a lot of the farm is being sold, as I said, to residential areas and so forth. And it's uh, it really is nice to be able to give a, a breathing space for these people almost. That yeah. this is a safe environment. My kids are safe here. Um, I can go mountain bike or trail run and grab a bite to eat and drink yeah so the formula is really if you want to start a successful brewery start with the market <laughs> or, or marry it's somebody with the market <laughs> we talk about the, the smack the standing you know, hazel dean <laughs> yeah. um yeah Marius, let's 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 talk about your beers. You've got some, you've got some normal beers, and then you've got some really interesting beers, and then you've got a barrel program, which not many yeah. other people have. Yeah, so um, 
I'd say when you when we started, it was crystal clear. We had to do a lager. Everybody mm. has to do a lager. That's a big, big uh, um, uh, percentage of beer drinkers drink lager in South Africa. Um, and that's not going to change. So, and it's not going to change, no. But that doesn't mean you have to do boring lagers either. Um, I mean, the lagers in Europe taste a lot different than the lagers <laughs> mass produced here in South Africa. Um, you know, so not that the mass produced lagers are bad, you know, they still won BJCP, won BJCP competitions, yeah. but there's not just one lager in the BJCP. So I, I looked at the, 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 the guideline and I sort of, well, what is whack? What is out there? What, what isn't there in South Africa? And that's why we started, the, uh, I developed the recipe for the Vienna lager, yes. um, which is a little, it's a darker lager. So people always think, oh, it's a dark beer. It's like a stout. It's not for me. I always have to calm them down. Don't worry. It might be a darker lager, but it's it's not, you know, dark in taste. Um, I mean, the difference is more you get those toasty biscuit caramel flavors. So it's got a really big malt backbone. And then with your noble hops, you know, the Hallertau, Mittelfra hops, really, um, it's uh, for many people, that's, that's a firm favorite. Then we brewed a, what, what we called at the time a premium pale pilsner. And it, uh, well, that's what it's called today, the premium pale pilsner, but it was called the India pale pilsner. I decided to off the bat, let's just experiment here. Let's make an IPA, but from a pilsner. And the hop profile won't be new age American style hops. We'll just hop the crap out of it with noble hops. So it was quite an expensive beer to brew at the time, I remember. Um, but at the same time, not a lot of people took to it. It was just too bitter, too over the top, uh, very resinous, fine resin. Um, I still liked it. And there's some people still today said, hey, man, you've got to bring that beer back. <laughs> so we decided with the second iteration to immediately tone it down and just um, more. So, so these days I would... It doesn't win BJCP competitions because it doesn't fall in a specific category. But that doesn't mean it's a bad beer. I'd say it's a hybrid between a Czech Pilsner and a German Pilsner. You know, it's got a little bit bit of both. It's not brewed with that really soft water. So you can never get that crispiness um, from the Czech Pilsner. And also Czech Pilsners are quite bitter, but not everybody likes that bitterness. So we turn down the bitterness. Um, so that's uh, that's our, uh, our other beer. But to flog 3,000 liters of that first batch of India Pale Pilsner now, what were we going to do? So, <laughs> so you know, I, I love it how you can just come up with plans to take one product and turn it into a completely different product. And at the time, my wife, Evelyn, was making uh, lemonade. She had her grandmother's recipe, uh, mother's recipe, and... Uh, it was it was really good lemonade, and we thought, okay, well, what? Somehow we 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 brainstormed and came up with a lemon rod le shandy, and we made this lemonade, and we mixed it with soda water, half half with a pilsner, and it tasted phenomenal. And till today, with the mountain bikers, it is a firm favorite. So we basically turned that whole batch of pilsner into radler, and at that stage. I mean, now some of the big guys are bringing out a Radler's commercial mm. version, but it just doesn't taste the same. You can taste when something is, has a lemon ester in it. Mm. It's unmistakably that lemon ester. So um, we make it from 100% squeezed lemon juice. I mean, you should see the boxes and boxes of, of lemon beer. <laughs> And my wife is saying when the brewery opens and we sell more of it, she's not doing this anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, so yeah, the Radler came, the Bice we, we, we brewed with Draymond's at the time. And again, I wanted a different spin. You can always go and buy somebody's Bice beer and just peddle it off on a different brand name. But I never thought that was a good idea or a good practice. You know, you can contract brew, but don't take somebody else's beer and just put another label on it, even if that brewer agrees to do it. So we, um, we developed our own vice, which was an amber vice just to differentiate ourselves from Draymond's and to make something different, a little bit darker, more caramel flavors in there. 
Um, so we brewed the, the vice, and there's quite a large German community in Pretoria East, especially living in Silver Lakes, which mm. is around the corner from us. So um, that immediately had a big fan base um, uh, for that. So we had those three. A few months went past, and we decided, well, we're pushing good enough numbers that we can introduce a fourth beer. Because as, as many lines of beer you have, everything is going to slow down. Um, so we we decided, well, we're on this dairy farm. This Our, our heritage comes from there. Our logo is a cow, uh, for crying out loud. So milk stout. That mm -hmm. was kind of the next evolved step to go to. So we... Um, um, I had already been brewing a few milk stouts um, and playing around with the recipe on homebrew level. Um, so we um, we did a few test runs and yeah, then then the milk stout is a firm favorite uh, still, uh, still till today. Especially, you know what, not only in winter, people think the dark beers are now winter beers, but a, a milk stout, because it's not so bitter, it's sweeter, it's really ideal, um, even as a, a refreshing summer mm. stout, I think. Um, then that was, that's basically our four core beers. I, I'd say okay. we brew. Uh, then after that, about two years ago, we, we introduced the American pale ale, the APA. Um, I like an APA and, you know, from those days of first drinking skeleton coast IPAs by the thousand bottles, I really wanted that malt backbone. But not something that is so bitter as theirs are. That it's it's an IPA. I, I feel like IPA is nice. It's it's more approachable for the general public, but it introduces them to these amazing hop flavors, um, which you'll find in the IPAs. But people don't necessarily like the bitterness. So we and we called it the Asia Pale A Pale Ale. So also APA, but the Asia Pale Ale. The Asians with the cows, the dairy cows, the Asia cows. Farm, so you know, again, it, it's so nice being creative and tying into this heritage with with the beer brands and um, so forth. So, yeah, the APA and those are really the four, five beers that's our core core lineup. I'd say we don't brew them all the time. Like for example, we, we don't do the vice at the moment because the shelf life is a lot less than the other beers. And with COVID and volumes dropping, we had to drop some lines. Mm. Um, but uh, we'll definitely, as things pick up again next summer, introduce the vice again. Okay. And and your barrel program? Okay, so shortly after we started, sort of towards the end of 2015, I met up or met um, Brendan from Frontier mm. Beer, Beer Co. And he was already doing weird sour stuff yeah. and uh, at the time. And not a lot of people were doing that, or hardly any. And that really gave me inspiration. So I, I, I drew on, on him for a lot of advice and almost mentorship in a way of how one goes about this. And lucky today, people are phoning me for the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, and it's nice to have learned and to impart knowledge onto others uh, because it's really growing an industry is far better than just growing, growing your own pockets or your own beer lineup. So um, the first sour beer we made was a Lambic. Um, uh, so Brennan was more brewing like Flanders red styles and those kind of things. Um, and I, at that time got the Lambic strain from Draymond's, which they brought in from overseas, um, uh, from, from Europe. And I got a sample of that and introduced it into a barrel. And that was our first beer and we entered it into the, um, SAMBT. And it actually, it, it won a silver medal. And that was our first beer to win a medal was, was the Lambic. I mean, these days we've, we've won many medals at various competitions, but uh, I'm proud of that one, that it's, that it's our Lambic. So that's what sparked it. After that, um, we started acquiring more barrels, you know, and it's pricey, the barrels, you know, then I don't come for free, especially if, you, I mean, you don't want to look on eBay or, you know, Gumtree for a barrel. <laughs> mm. You want to really uh, uh, connect with a, with a winery, but they're also a very closed industry and they don't want to really share that kind of thing. You're more like a nuisance, you know, they, mm. they give, they sell and like 30 barrels at a time to some other guy that's going to sell them on or whatever. 
they don't want to deal with you than want the one or two barrels. But uh, yeah, through a connection, we got uh, um, we got some barrels, and then we started doing more lambics because of the success of the of the plum. We thought, well, we need to do another batch of plum lambic. Unfortunately, it takes a minimum of two years to create such a barrel. So we literally had that first success, and then we had to wait two years longer before we could bring <laughs> out some, uh, which was a long wait. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, after that, we started doing cricks, um, uh, from bois. Um, we've now recently put used pear in this. And what's nice about this is, Yes, the crick with the cherries and the framboise, you know, those are the traditional styles of fruit to use. But no, but nothing stops you from using pears or plums or, you know, we've used the red plums and the yellow plums and, you know, totally different beers coming out of those two different plums, for example. Um, and the, the, the nice thing is you look for fruit at the time when it goes out of season mm. and you get those that are overripe, which is perfect for this uh, um, purpose. And instead of having to buy cherries, which are now hovering at maybe 120 rand a kilo, you're picking up plums at nine rand a kilo. Yeah. <laughs> and typically for a, for a barrel, you know, our rule of thumb is to use 50 kilograms of fruit per barrel. So you'll probably, you know, the barrel is 220 liters. So, you know, per volume, you're going to maybe use 180 liters of beer in there your fruit in there and then at the end of the day two or three years later when you take it out a large portion has evaporated and the other portion is sitting in this muck at the bottom which you uh, can't use so there's the the yield is a lot less after this whole aging process and you know that's what people always ask me what like 90 or 110 rand for this bottle that's ridiculous then if you go and explain them the process of you know Yes, this thing had to. We had to look after it for three years, and and the likes, and uh, you know, it kind of makes sense why these price points. But uh, no, it's not a big market in South Africa, but we're hopefully playing our part in creating the market, yeah. so that five or ten years from now, more people are asking at the supermarkets for sour beer or lambics. Or but if you go to the um, Capital Craft Festival. There's a big queue at the at the guy that's selling the lambic, um, so there is a market for it. People just have to discover it. I'd say there's a market, but people here are very much used to the um, back sweet and uh, okay. Lindemann or Leafmans. <laughs> you know that they love. You know more almost that sherbet like sweetness yeah. they get from it. Um, it's refreshing. Our lambics are very much more tailored at the traditional okay. um, flavor. So the bread profile is quite high. You know, it potentially is a lot more sour, and we don't back sweeten it. Mm. So you, um, the, the flavors are very intense and, and all over the place. Whereas, for example, I've never tried a kettle sour. Kettle sours are easy and quick to do. And I'm sure you can actually create some nice, refreshing drinks, but they'll never have the depth of a beer that were naturally soured in a barrel over two mm. years. And I remember those first few barrels, I taste after a year, and I'm like, but it's not sour yet. What's wrong? Like, is it going to ever be sour? <laughs> or is it just going to go off? And, you know, truth, Bob, you know, two years, three years later, it is sour. It is sour. <laughs> it's just for the micro, the sour just takes three years. <laughs> So are those only sold in bottles? Yeah, we we, we do from time to time uh, do a keg. So, for example, at the, um, the Clarence Festival now, we're going to probably take a, a, a keg of the Frambois, the Creek, as well, because these are beers that have just come out of the barrel. Um, the Creek is also, we entered that, uh, these two, and the Frambois in the African Beer Cup now. Um We'll see if anything comes from it. Um, we've won medals for the previous Crick and the Plum Lambic last year. Um, so we've got confidence that it is not just a good product. It is it is on spec with what, what the guideline says it should taste like. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we mostly bottle it because it's so expensive mm. to, to make. But for this festival, we're making an exception and taking the, the beer and not actually – 
pricing it at that same price. That, so it, it will be affordable and accessible. So yeah, it's it's exciting because not that that's really how you get your product out to the most people is at a festival. Yeah, it sounds like uh, that's a really good excuse to go to Clarence. No, absolutely. I think there's still Friday Friday tickets left. <laughs> yeah, I've got a ticket for Friday, so I'll, I'll be there on Friday. Yeah, wonderful. Cool. That, that's a very exciting story um, and fascinating. I, I've never seen um, a barrel barrel beer before, um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to visiting you. How often do you actually make uh, these beers? So during COVID times, these last two years, we were a little bit lax of actually working hard at the program. But normally in the previous years, we would put three barrels in to, to barrel. So um, that basically we keep on doing that so that every year after three years, you'll have three barrels coming out. Mm. And especially three different barrels of different different types of things. Um, so... At the moment, these are these are coming out, so we have to now put put them in. But yo, the the price of cherries just you know going fifty kilograms, yo, that's that's a that's a hard sell, mm. you know, to now go buy five thousand rand of cherries and your priced beer, which could just be sold off right now to somebody, yeah. <laughs> and bag it basically in a barrel well, that may or may not go acetic, yeah. and you can't drink. Um, so it's uh, it's 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 risk, but you know, no no risk, no reward yeah. at the end of the day. So yeah, so so we'd like to have at this stage three barrels coming out every year. Mm. Okay. Back to the to the brewery. When is the best best time to visit you? Is it when the markets open? It's yeah, it's market times. Um, obviously, our beer is available um, at the bike bike park. Okay. At the moment, because they've, they've got a beverage stand that's open the whole day from six to six, so our beer is available there, and that that that's great that we don't have to have a tap there, but it's in bottle, bottle yeah. and can. So, but but it's but it's there, so people can drink it. And then obviously on Saturdays and Sundays from nine nine o'clock in the morning to four, we're actually there from eight already. Mm. Um, to four. Um, there's a park run there um, on the Saturday, Saturday, so you know that brings a lot they they enjoy the beer after mm. <laughs> struggling with the 5k's and uh um so saturday is a good good day <sighs> unfortunately being an outdoor venue it's very weather dependent mm. so if it rains there's nobody and you twiddle your thumbs but if it's a nice sunny day everybody's out there's nice lawns um so yeah saturday or sunday um either of those are good weather's good you mentioned um Metal tanks. What other suppliers do you use that you, that you can recommend? You know, Brewhogs, OC Brewing, Draymonds. You know, they are frankly we are contract brewing there, but in a sense they are suppliers as mm. well. I mean, they yes. are brewing our beer. Um, uh, we've had great relationship with all of them. We've got a good relationship with Africa Hops. Um, they they supply us with hops because we also do quite a lot of dry hopping. Yeah, from an equipment side in Pretoria, we use Bevan a lot from Draftcraft. Um, he's he's really our, our go-to guy. You know, he's the kind of guy that at an awkward time on a Friday afternoon late or even a Sunday morning or a Saturday morning, he'll say, yes, come by for a coupler or a regulator or a this or a that. And uh, again, that kind of ties into that sense of community. So, mm. you know, we... I, I can probably use other guys, bigger guys, that even the price might be better, but I like to support Draft Craft. Well, Marius, it's been been wonderful geeking out with you. Um, we don't often get to get the opportunity to talk about those sort of beers that you make, and your story is fantastic. So thank you for sharing it with us today. Yeah, thank you very much, Holger. Um, and just give us your website. So the website is just Hazeldean Brewing, a one word, .co.za. Often people are like, Hazeldean Brewery? I'm like, no, Hazeldean Brewing, <laughs> I-N-G, .co.za. And then, yeah, we've got a store online. And if, if you are bold and you want to 
try those uh, sour beers and Bretna Mice's wild yeast beers and the barrel age stuff and even our normal lineup. Uh, we've got a store and we ship, uh, we courier. So yeah, um, go there and try some of our beers if this has uh, uh, made you thirsty. Thank you for listening to our stories here online. In the show notes, you will also find a link where you can subscribe to become part of our community and be notified when we upload our latest content.